So I've done that. Okay, so here we are, um, March 6th, and we've missed almost a whole full month of classes or three three other classes. So what I'm going to do is scroll down and show you things which you should reread on your own to catch up. The thing about the competition, the basics of competition, this is important because of all the six environments, political, economic, social, cultural, technology, geographic, and competition, the most important one is competition for the very simple reason that is if you don't have any competition, you can sell your product for what you want. You can have any colors or many colors or no colors or free shipping or access because you've got no competition. So competition influences how you do things. That's the fundamentals. And so you should read through this on your own again to make sure you understand, particularly also knowing who your competition is. In the case of Seneca, for example, we had a staff meeting a while ago. And they're talking about Seneca's competition being George Brown and Centennial. And I said, no, no, no. That's the wrong way to think of it. Seneca's competition is not George Brown or Sheridan College or Centennial College. Seneca's biggest competition is not going to college. And they said, what do you mean? I said, there's all kinds of jobs that you can do without having to go to college. And it looked like I was, you know, being a trader or something, but I'm just keeping it real. For example, you could be a firefighter without going to college. You could just volunteer to join the fire department. And after a couple of years, you take all these courses on the weekend and you become a firefighter. The same thing with being a police officer. You don't have to take police foundations at college to be a policeman, right? There's all kinds of private security companies that you can get training at to join the police force. So that's the first thing is to know who is your competition. And sometimes this company is selling the same thing or different things. Uh, Coke and Pepsi, you think that's competition, right? But in reality, this is Coke's competition. So I want you to read the rest of this so you understand that thing about competition, okay? Then the three sources of information, government, associations, and corporate web pages. Watch this video. Make a comment on the video. This is very important. And industry associations is one of the things that will help you. So, for example, if your company is, is McDonald's, one of the things that you can find out on the website of associations would be the Canadian Fast Food Franchise Owners Association or the Canadian Association for Fast Food Retailers or something like that. There's all kinds of industry associations you could use. In the case of automotive, like Tesla, there's things like the Automotive Parts Manufacturers Association or the Canadian Automotive Retailers Association or the Toronto Area Retailers Association. Those are companies' websites that you could go to and get all kinds of information about automotive stuff. Um, Tim Hortons, the same thing with uh, McDonald's and something about climate change for the last group. All right, let's just continue here. Uh, globalization. So you should read this section here talking about globalization of customers and production. So you have some comments to talk about that. Last time I mentioned very briefly on February 6th. And sustainability, that should be a part of everybody's group. So Tim Hortons, for example, if you go to Google and just type in here, Tim Hortons sustainability, they probably have something on their website. Yes, they do. The white hot beverage, okay, they're probably making them out of recyclable materials now. So there's all kinds of things that companies are doing to try to show that they are sensitive to sustainability. So every group should put something in there like that. Just use the word Tesla and sustainability. And there'll be some topics in there that you can find, all right? So read that to make sure you understand what sustainability is all about. It's a word that people use these days, but they don't understand how far reaching it is. Okay, um, the cultural environment we talked about. The reason is because there's so many things about culture that influence how people buy and sell products in terms of whether it's a food flavoring or clothing or weather or so on. And then we also talked about cultural diasporas, uh, which is, tells me here, we did this on Monday, January 30th. So somebody can earn some class participation marks right now if they just shout out to me what is a diaspora and why is it useful to know that? Anybody? Anybody know what a diaspora is? No, 
Okay, so it's a large group of people who came from one country to live in another country. An example of a diaspora would be the millions and millions of white Canadians of Scotch-Irish background who came to Canada in the 1850s and the 1860s, immigrated from England, Scotland, Ireland to settle in Canada. So most of the people in Canada, you know, who are, uh, what you might say, white background or European background are actually not English. They speak English language, but the family background would come from Scotland and Ireland. Diaspora also includes things like large numbers of people from India, with Hindi background, living in South Africa, or large numbers of people from the Philippines living in Toronto, or large numbers of people from Hong Kong living in Vancouver. So that's what a diaspora is. And it's good to understand this international business because it helps us. For example, Canada is very good at developing new business in high tech in India for a very simple reason, that there are thousands and thousands of Canadians of Desi background whose parents speak Hindi, Gujarati, Brahmin, Urdu, Punjabi, etc. And they get jobs with the Canadian government uh, doing business in India, and they speak Hindi, but also English perfectly. And that's an example of how people from diasporas can help you in international business. All right. Um, we also talked about Canada-U.S. relations and some of the differences between the two. And here's an example of a funny uh, video which you should watch and earn some class participation marks about. I noted this very briefly. It says here on January 30th, but I want you to watch the video and learn about what these guys did. Basically, these are some of my former students at U of T Scarborough campus who got in a car one day and drove to Buffalo and walked around with their uh, video camera talking to Americans about what they think about Canadians. And it's kind of interesting. Uh, the geographic differences between Canada and the United States. Um, basically, uh, what I did in this lecture was describe to the students how much of a big difference there is between Canada and USA. And a lot of it is based on things that you can't do anything about, like geography, right? The reason why there's 40 million people living in California is because you don't have 10 feet of snow in the wintertime, right? The weather there is warmer. You can grow grapes and sell wine and things like that. Whereas in Canada, you, most of our population is here, a little bit here, and then a very, very small up here. Look, this whole area here, 44,000 people. Whereas in the same size area, you have 40 million. So 40,000 versus 40 million. One of the reasons why is because it's very, very cold up here and there's not enough plants. So if you lived there, you'd have to import all of your food, 100% of all your food. Uh, Northwest Territories, Nunavut. These 38,000 people live there. Their background is originally indigenous or First Nations. But most of them have moved to southern Canada where it's warmer and easier to have lifestyle because 100% of all the food that these people eat here is imported from the south and costs incredibly high prices. So I also wanted to talk about, or, uh, so I made some sort of comments about that and the comments in the video here. All right, uh, viral marketing. One of the reasons we talk about this in international business is um, the reason why you do this technique is to be able to let you sell a product to people. Just a second. Sorry. So the reason why we talk about viral marketing is in the context of being able to advertise to people of different cultures by using symbols and shapes and, and uh, circumstances which other people can relate to. So that's why I want you to reread this section here on viral marketing. And then when you're doing your uh, group project, whether it be Tim Hortons or Bombardier or Tesla or McDonald's, see if you can find some examples of viral videos that they use in their advertising and comment on them and whether you think that they're effective or not. All right. Um, ethical situation. So you can find ethical things about all the different companies. Uh, for example, Tim Hortons. And just type in ethics and you'll find some things about privacy violations, sponsorship from Hockey Canada. And you could just write a couple of paragraphs about this. Someone in the group could say, okay, I'll be responsible for that. Talk about uh, Tesla and ethics and so on. All right, corporate social responsibility. Yes, um, you could find 
things about corporate social responsibility for all of the companies that uh, you've told me about so far, certainly McDonald's, Tesla, Bombardier, and Tim Hortons. And this is a video which summarizes the main points of the corporate social responsibility. So if you haven't watched that, please do that. Okay, um, stakeholders, I also talked about that in class of money. Can anybody tell me right now the origins of the meaning of the word stakeholders and why it's useful to know that? The first person, mm -hmm. to... go ahead, Josh. Uh, I don't know where it came from, but isn't it someone who holds like a percentage of a company? Yes, you're partly right, but it could be a little bit more than that. So let's say you are a person who uh, owns a bookstore and the bookstore supplies the textbooks to Seneca. And if Seneca starts teaching online, they may switch from buying physical textbooks to paying for money for access to websites so the student could see the online material. So if you can't make that switch from selling textbooks to selling online content, then you're going to lose a business, right? So that's an example of a stakeholder. So your company would have a stake in the success or failure of the college at using online teaching to be able to get more students, okay? And the word stick, stakeholders comes from the story about how people used to go out in the woods and dig around for gold and they take a wooden stake like a piece of wood and stick it in the ground and mark on the side of it their name and then when they come back later uh, there are places marked out it's staked out so that's the expression stakeholder can also be somebody who has something to gain or lose for example um, if there's a lot of money spent on snowplow clearing then if you had the contract with Seneca to provide snowplow clearing in the wintertime because of the geographic environment, then you're going to make more money, as an example. Right? Uh, Hiran, son, I see your hand up. Go ahead, please. Yes. Uh, as I know, the stakeholders can be group or individual person uh, who can make a decision yes. for the group direction. Sure, sure. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, now the next thing we talked about that I don't know if we did on Monday class was about the different orientations, product orientation, sales orientation, marketing orientation. You were supposed to have learned this in Marketing 106. I don't know if you did or not, but it's a very important concept in terms of international business. So I'll just try to describe it really quickly. A product orientation means if I want to sell you something, I'm going to describe the product itself, like the FABs. Do you ever hear about that? The FABs, features, advantages, and benefits. So if I was going to sell you my watch, uh, I would say one of the features is it's waterproof. Therefore, the advantage is I don't have to take it off. I can put it on my wrist, and everywhere I go on vacation, it's okay. The benefit, therefore, is that I can have a watch that I can wear on sunny days or rainy days. So that's features, advantages, and benefits, right? So if I was to sell you my watch, my orientation or the way I go about doing it would be to talk about the product itself. And the idea or the concept is that if that you describe the product in a really sexy way, like it's got a stainless steel bracelet and et cetera, then people would be attracted to buy it. Okay, so that's a product orientation. A sales orientation is to presume that everybody knows what the product is all about. You don't need to describe it. All I have to do is talk about the price. And I can convince you to buy my watch compared to somebody else's watch because their watch costs $800 and my watch costs $600. So sales orientation is when you talk to somebody to get them to buy your stuff because you say it's a little bit cheaper than the competition. And thirdly, the marketing orientation means that you talk to someone first to find out what they're interested in. Then you pitch them the watch. So an example would be in this video right here, I uh, show this in class. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the link in here. And I'm going to beg every single person in class today. I'm telling all of you 11 people, watch that video and make a comment before midnight. And I'll give you class participation marks. Okay.
sorry, someone is at the front door. So a marketing orientation is for me in the video as I explain this with the watch. I walk up to somebody and I say to them, so you look kind of athletic. Uh, what kind of sports do you do? And they say, okay, I play hockey, golf. I say, do you do any swimming? They say, no. Then I say, okay, thank you. Have a nice day. I walk up to another person. I say, okay, you're sort of athletic. Uh, do you do any outdoor sports? Yeah. Do you do any swimming or skin diving? And they say, yes, I do. And then you say, well, does it include doing scuba diving? They say, no, just skin diving. Okay. Then you walk on to another person. You say, hi, how are you? Uh, do you like uh, outdoor sports? Do you like swimming and scuba diving? And they say, yes. And you say, so you've been doing scuba diving for a while, five or 10 years? They say, yes. And then you say, okay, therefore, you know how important it is to have a watch on your wrist, which is very accurate in keeping time. So that when you are scuba diving and you look at your watch and it says 10 minutes of air left, you really do have 10 minutes of air and you've got time to get up out the surface so you don't drown. So that's what a marketing orientation is, is when you have a conversation with somebody to find out what they're actually really interested in. And then once they confirm yes or no, they're interested, then you say, okay, and by the way, here's the watch. You describe the price. Okay. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to have an understanding of these three points. All right. This is really is a fundamental thing about being a person who knows how to sell in business and marketing because too many companies these days just focus on describing the physical features of the product, not actually having a conversation. So watch that video to make sure you understand that point. And somebody in your group will have to tell me in the final group project, just in a couple of paragraphs, whether the company had a product orientation or a sales orientation, like whether it's Bombardier or Tim Hortons or, or song. Okay. All right. Then uh, as we got further into uh, February, we started talking about things like first mover advantages and second mover advantages. Now, the reason why we talk about this is because in international business, when companies grow and expand overseas, we sometimes think that the ones who went first may have an advantage that is difficult to overcome for other people. For example, um, for example, uh, how many people here have been to uh, McDonald's outside of Canada or USA? Has anybody here ever been to McDonald's in another country? Yeah, so, I, mean, I have been. South Korea. South Korea, okay. Did the McDonald's, thank you. In the McDonald's in South Korea, did it have any menu combinations that look a little bit different than Canada? Yes. Yeah. Okay, and, the, and the McDonald's in India, did it have any types of things on the menu a little bit different than Canada? Yes. Okay, so that's following the social cultural environment, right? The other thing too is when we say early bird gets a worm, what that means is if you are McDonald's USA and you want to expand into Asia, so you go to Japan, South Korea, Hong Kong, India. If somebody else comes along later, like Burger King or KFC, and they also want to expand, it might be difficult because the customers who are in Japan, Korea, Hong Kong, et cetera, are saying, no, no, we already are customers of McDonald's. We're going to continue with McDonald's. So you have an advantage if you are first. But sometimes the second mover gets the cheese. What that means is in business and marketing, sometimes the company goes first, has to spend a lot of money to get those customers. And they may not be successful because the other company is watching and waiting. So one of the best examples of this is Yahoo versus Google. So Yahoo was the first search engine. Why is Google more popular? Well, because Yahoo went first, right? There, the early bird gets the worm. But sometimes, that doesn't work out very good. And Google was made by some PhD math students, university in California, who had a better algorithm than the Yahoo algorithm. And they were able to produce a search engine that collected more content than the Yahoo search engine. 
So people started switching from Yahoo to Google, even though Yahoo was first and Google was second. So the reason for telling you this story is sometimes if a company is good at inventing some concept, they can have a big advantage. But in other cases, sometimes a company who comes along in second place can look at the mistakes of the first company. So another good example is Subway versus McDonald's, right? McDonald's is the fastest, largest, most famous fast food company in the world. Um, but why is Subway bigger now? Because McDonald's is expensive. To open up a McDonald's, you need a million dollars or $1.5 million because you need a parking lot. You need a French fry machine. You need a refrigerator. You need the espresso shots. You need the muffins, the salad, the filet -O fish the chicken. It's a lot of things to make into McDonald's. But in a subway, it's very, very small. You're making a sandwich. I mean, that's something you learn when you're 12 years old, when your parents stay out late and don't come home, right? So this is why uh, it's a good example. Of if a company is trying to come up with some new idea, you don't have to be first. Sometimes you can be second. And you watch how the first company fails, and then you avoid those mistakes to become successful yourself. All right. The political environment. So this is when he got in towards the middle of uh, February. We talked about embassies and consulates. Um, so if you don't know about embassies and consulates, watch this video. It'll tell you about who they are and what they're about and the difference between an embassy, a consulate, and a consulate general. So my question to you is, can you tell me, as far as you understand right now, without watching the video, what is the difference between an embassy and a consulate. Does anybody know? Not really. All right. So Canada has an embassy in Seoul, Korea, because Seoul is the capital city of Korea. Canada has an embassy in Tokyo, because Tokyo is the capital of Japan. But Canada also has a consulate in Osaka, which is another big city in Japan. Canada has an embassy in Washington, which is the capital city of the United States. But they also have a consulate in New York City, because that's where many Canadian companies do business. So the embassy is a word for the largest government location for a foreign country in the other country's capital city. So, for example, China has an embassy in Ottawa because Ottawa is the capital city. But there's lots of Chinese businesses in Toronto. So China also has a consulate in Toronto. They also have a consulate in uh, Vancouver. So that's the difference between the word embassy and a consulate. So the embassy is the biggest office in the capital city. And just a second. Okay. Then uh, last week before the break, we talked about political risk and contingency planning. This is a big, big takeaway for the whole entire course and talks about many things in here that you need to know about contingency planning for the simple reason that the world is a more difficult place. And this is how companies have to do things to survive. So one of my students in another section explained how uh, one of the contingency plans of the Cathay Pacific during the COVID, they moved their airplanes to Australia and parked them so that they wouldn't rust in the warm weather of Hong Kong, which I thought was a good example. Other contingency plans are things dealing with a risk like when companies lose their equipment or are expropriated or other examples of risk situations. Okay, and then we talked about uh, defensive risk and integrative risk and then personal risk. So this is the biggest takeaway uh, before the break. This is a little story I had about my students. One of my contingency plans was if the power ever went out, the way I was gonna deal with it was let the students go downstairs to the cafeteria and they could finish writing their exams down there 
instead of worrying about if the power goes off in the in the building itself. So that's a contingency plan that I used. That's also one of the reasons why I won Professor of the Year Award because I came up with that idea. Because I thought to myself, at some point in time, what is going to happen if I'm ever in the middle of writing an exam with my students and all of a sudden the power goes off? What am I going to do? So I had to think of this solution. And the students thought it was kind of cool that they could do that because then if you can imagine if you're in the middle of writing an exam and the power goes off, they can't let you stay in the building. You have to leave the building because the lights wouldn't work in the washroom and the computer podium wouldn't work and, and so on, right? So part of a having effective contingency plan is to use your imagination and think about how a problem could develop that would affect you. And then when you think of a solution, you tell your students in advance, this is what could happen. So the reason why this was so successful is because once I came up with this idea, I told all my students every year for two or three years, hey, by the way, in this class, if it ever happens that we're in the middle of writing a midterm exam and the power goes out, Here's what we're going to do. And it worked. One time, two years later, after I did that, the power went out. All the students follow me, we'll go downstairs to go sit down. They just continue running their exam. And when they left, they just went over the fence like this student here and just walk away and go home. I have the exams marked the next week, and everybody was very happy. Contingency planning. We'll also talk about some other personal risk situations. And then we had our break week. And then after the break week, uh, we start talking about some of these things here. So um, that's where we are right now. I'm going to click on stop recording.